Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Wilson, um, and a lot of my colleagues will be bringing you through just some or an overview of some accessibility tips and tricks. It's not meant to be a real deep dive, um, but in kind of a, a previous brief, we got a lot of questions um, about making documents, spreadsheets, presentations, et cetera, um, accessible and some of the, the top things that we see. So um, we were requested to have follow up and that's what we're here for today. Uh, so we'll start with uh, introductions. Again, my name is Alex Wilson. Um, I'm in the, <clears throat> I'm, I work for the IT accessibility team uh, and the offices of digital strategy um, for the Office of Government Line Policy or OGP of GSA. Uh, Mike and Drew, you wanna introduce? Sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Michael Horton. Uh, I also work in, within the Office of Government-Wide Policy on the IT Accessibility Team as an accessibility advisor uh, to uh, folks at GSA, but uh, again, government-wide on all facets of the things that we're talking about today. So uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Yeah, thanks. And I, I'm Andrew Nielsen. Uh, like, like Mike and, and Alex work together on the same team on our IT accessibility team, the, the government wide IT accessibility program. Uh, I'm a little bit new to government. I've only been a federal employee for just over a year now. Uh, but before that I was in, in consulting for, uh, to the federal government and about the 10 year, uh, past 10 years, uh, directly supporting IT accessibility programs or IT accessibility in some way. Excellent, thanks guys. Um, so today what we're gonna do is, is go through uh, just a, a few slides um, that we created just on some accessibility tips and tricks. Uh, we'll be going back and forth between um, either a presentation or a spreadsheet depending on what we're talking about. So just bear with us on that. Uh, we have everything queued up, but in case there's any issues, um, just bear with us. Um, so we'll start with the presentation. We're gonna turn our, our videos off now and then um, during the question and answer session at the end, uh, we'll turn them back on so you'll be able to see us for, uh, for that, but we didn't want to be have any distractions for uh, the presentation piece. Um, that being said, if there's any uh, questions, um, feel free to submit them in the chat. Andrew and Mike will be monitoring those, capturing those for the end, uh, but if there's anything that needs immediate clarification on, on some of the briefing materials that we have, um, then they'll just interject and say, you know, just for clarity's sake or um, just to be clear, this is, this is what we mean by this accessibility tip or trick um, or way of, of doing things. So uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and, and kind of just start. Uh, I'll, I'll start leading through the presentation. Uh, Mike will jump in and, and Andrew and Mike will both uh, be going and, and um, bolstering the presentation as we go forward. Okay, so here we have our presentation for today. Again, uh, Alex Wilson, Mike Corden, uh, Drew or Andrew Nielsen. And we'll just be going through some tips and tricks and focusing mostly on spreadsheets um, and presentation. Uh, but we also have uh, this document is, is already posted in PDF format on the digital.gov website. Um, there's additional Word doc and, and PDF tips in there that we won't have really time to go over today. Um, then some additional links to information to digital.gov sites, um, some additional external sites, as well as some of the great information we have on section 508.gov. Uh, and then we'll have hopefully a, a really a robust um, question period at the end, uh, which is why we kind of extended uh, the session um, to, to 90 minutes from a, a general 60. So jumping right in. Um, so spreadsheet accessibility, um, this was one of the things that I talked about in, in the last session. Um, that's also posted on digital.gov. I believe that was titled um, uh, plain language in the intersection with accessibility um, or, or similar. Uh, so you can go view that, uh, but there's just a little bit of information there on spreadsheet accessibility. So that was one of the, the major drivers for this event. Got a lot of questions coming through on that. So overall, just starting on the left there in the left block, left blue box, um, the the document um, overall formatting and um, the 
the text formatting. So this basically applies to all the, the types of documents you're gonna create, whether it's a PDF, whether it's a, um, a PowerPoint, um, Excel, et cetera. You wanna have a descriptive file name um, and that being you know, this one, accessibility presentation, uh, even putting the data in generally, um, but accessibility presentation to digital.gov audience or something like that. Um, another thing within the document, um, this is something that we'll see as we as we look at the, the demo, uh, is you wanna have unambiguous links. So um, not just a, a hyperlink that is uh, to a web page or, or a different um, document of, you know, click here for more information. You wanna make sure that it's, you're, you're saying, um, you know, visit section 5 uh, create page for more information. Um, so you just wanna be specific in that so that screen readers and people who are just coming into the document um, know what you're looking up to. Um, one of the things that, that people really had questions on was table formatting. Um, and that's kind of where we'll start in terms of the, the demos. Um, one, ensure you're just not pasting a table in there. Screen readers are not gonna read that. I guess you, you could do that if it's very, um, not a lot of information and then put everything in alt text. Uh, but then why have a table if you do that? Um, one of the things that, that screen readers also can't do is, is uh, not very well anyway, um, is view merged or split cells. Um, and this is something I talked about in, in the last talk as well. Um, it's, that's not really good practice of using a merge cell anyway, because once you do that, you can no longer filter the information. So you can't really use, um, you can't really use Excel in the way it's supposed to be used, filtering, sorting, um, you know, lookups, any, any sort of that thing if you have merge cells. So you can lose a lot of functionality if you do that. And it's also um, not accessible, not compliant or conformant. And therefore um, that, that's just a, a tip not to do. Uh, another thing that you wanna do is that um, screen readers will read just or defaulted to uh, one informational header row and one header column, and we'll see what that what that is. But basically, you have just one title column, and then you know whether the first column where it's a question, whether it's a person's name, and then all the information follows. You only want um, one informational uh, column and one informational row. Um, and then in terms of the native feature to define tables. Uh, that's just a way that, um, you know, Excel and then thus the screener can show that this group of information is um, the information you're looking for. And we'll get into that uh, with demo one right now. Okay, so this is the this is the first demo. This one uh, purposely has errors in it as the other demos do as well. Uh, so we can show you the remediation and that's kind of the point of today was want to do instead of just kind of going through a deck actually um, try to do you know live show you some of the the issues and then you know how you would do it in a different way to make it conformant uh, or just easier to read better um, so in this case uh, as i just mentioned you have two header rows um, for the information so that's not conformant so um, and then you also have a merge cell here a merge cell here um, so not, not good. And then you also have two informational columns before you actually get to the data. Um, so if you were to create a graph of this, um, even Excel would think that this is the first informational portion. And that would, you know, that would really mess up a graph if you did that. Um, but it's also really hard to read and it's not clear that this is an informational column uh, or that this is an informational column and not, not a, a standard data column. So, and then as you can see that the final point that we kind of put on um, for this section is the, uh, a link that has very nondescript information. So it goes to, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but if you hover over, it goes to section five way to gov slash create, which is where all, all of this or a lot of this information um, exists uh, for the section five way gov site. Um, but it, you can't tell that just by looking at it. So one way of doing it, um, would be to just create two tables. Um, and you would say, all right, the agency questions and the PM response, backup PM response. Um, that is all of this information here, right? And then for the second, you would, the information would fall under this table. And that's just a way to do it um, in two tables. You could do it on two tabs as well. 
Um, uh, but that's just a way to break it up. And then additionally, there's now there's only one header row for each of the tables. Um, this will still be read by a screen reader, but it's not part of the table. Um, but it, it's still telling you when you go to this tab, this is the information that you'll find in this tab. Um, so it still serves the same purpose. Um, and then as you can see, this header, this has already been um, selected as a table. Um, but another way or way to do it actually, as I mentioned, um, name it as a range so that uh, Excel knows, the program knows that this is an actual table. You would just insert um, table and that's the range. My table has headers and that's the header row done. And now it is a, it's a table. I know I did that really quickly. Um, so I'll show it again. You go in, you go to table and it, since it was already selected, it just defaults to that. You ensure that my table has header rows because we do have headers and you hit okay. And now you have what's called a named range for Excel uh, with a header row, a header column. And so if you were to graph this, um, then it would, um, it's not gonna graph this because it's not data. So that would be, um, that's a little off. You kind of want all of the same type of information. Uh, but if you were to at least graph these first two, um, then it would have this as um, the, the X axis, the, the horizontal axis, and then the, the numbers would be um, within the, the, the chart. Okay, so another way to do it then um, is to to include it all on the same table is you would just, one, you, you put this as not part of the table. Um, again, this just becomes an informational cell, but it's actually not part of the table. Um, and then you would just combine the first two, um, the first two rows into, I'm sorry, the first two columns into one column. So this is an agency question, and then that's the question. Um, this is PM question one, that's the PM question, first PM question. And so you still get the same effect, everything is still on the same table, um, and, but you still only have it in one table. So just another way, you're basically just uh, yeah, concatenating, bringing these two um, columns from the error written one, you bring this column and this column together into one. So those are, those are the two primary ways of, of doing it. Uh, and again, you have a, a very descript um, link at the bottom, visit section5way.gov create page for additional information. Okay, so that's the end of the, the first demo. Uh, we'll go back to the presentation. Alrighty. Uh, and, and Mike and, and Drew, uh, feel free to, to interject if there's any um, additional clarification requested by, uh, by people in the, in the chat. And again, um, as we go through uh, for, for all attendees, just submit information in the chat. Um, Mike and, and Andrew will be monitoring that and uh, they can bring anything up that, that doesn't necessarily make sense or um, just save the questions for the end, depending. Yeah, hey, Alex, uh, we, we do have a question about, or a comment on, on table titles uh, in, in the chat. Um, the, the, the comment was the table titles should be in text before the table, not in the, row, the top row of the table, which is true. Uh, the, uh, and, and that goes to the points that, that Alex uh, shared about um, you know, not having merged cells. And, and, and when we use head, uh, table headings, uh, row headings and column headings, um, uh, then we're giving those cues within the document. Um, adding an extra extra header row uh, can tend to, to uh, uh, confuse people who are using screen readers. So yeah, that's a good tip. Uh, just like Alex has demonstrated here on the screen, uh, add the title uh, information before the table, keep it outside of the table. Thanks, Alex. Excellent, all right. Um, so, that was demo one, um, mostly on uh, the documents themselves, again, applying to all digital content, and then um, just some, some high level tips and tricks on uh, table formatting. So next, what we wanna talk about, and this is what often people use Excel for, and that is uh, formatting and in, including and formatting graphs. So Excel is a, a good way in which to originally create graphs. A lot of times you then take that graph and, and put it into like a PowerPoint or a G slide 
um, or eventually save it to a PDF. Uh, but you generally would, would build it in the spreadsheet um, program that you're using. And right now, I just want to talk about a few high level things for that as well. Um, one, um, and this is number one thing, I think people do tend to do this um, often is kind of using just color to display information. Um, so one, you want to separate, you know, if there's different lines, like if it's a line chart, you want to have um, different vertices on the lines themselves. Um, but if you're also um, having, you know, if you're something's like high, medium, low, and we'll show that as an example later, you know, green, uh, standard green, yellow, red, or, or a stoplight um, chart that you're trying to use, you want to call that out in another way than just green, yellow, red, because um, that may be hard to see or, or not visible um, by some people. Uh, next thing is uh, use as a table as an alternative means. So if there's a lot of information in the graph and it's not easy to convey in, in alt text, um, which you know any relatively um, uh, not difficult but relatively involved graphic will have a lot of different points, a lot of different um, uh, series like lines or bars um, for a bar graph on it. Uh, a way to get around, um, not get around, but a way to provide. Uh, equivalent means of um, displaying and, and presenting that information is including um, that a table or presenting it even right next to the graphic itself. Um, so you have an easy way to to reference the information, and that also, you know, especially if there's a lot of information on a graph, even for um, those that don't necessarily have a a, um, a a visual disability, you might you know just be easier to actually see the information if you also provide in the table as opposed to just, you know, plopping a graph on a, on a Word document. Um, and we'll get into that in, in the demo to see a little bit more about how you can do that. Um, the next is the, the graphs are, um, the images have alternative text, and we'll talk about this multiple times, so I won't necessarily go into too much in this demo. Um, but one of the things we wanna do for each of the graphs in any document you want, um, you create, you wanna include alternative text um, to describe the, the picture, um, the icon here, we have four icons on the left, um, describe the icon in alt text, describe the graphic, um, or the chart uh, in alternative text on the side. Um, and this includes the, the final point there, that includes kind of the main takeaways of the graph and what you want people to see. Um, so if you're not including a table as an, alter, um, as an alternative means, then you definitely uh, want to include information in the alternative text on the, the few main points that you want people to pull out of the graphic. So we'll go over to um, our second demo here. So this one, um, this graph has a lot of errors. It's, it also doesn't necessarily even look good from a, a setup point in the sense of, you know, there's a lot of unnecessary um, specificity Decision here that is on the right, um, and there's no naming of axes, uh, which is not necessarily a uh, accessibility thing, just not uh, best practice in terms of setting it up. Um, but what I had mentioned before in terms of the the high, medium, low, um, using a red, yellow, green here, um, which which may be hard for for some people even on this call to see. Um, this is yellow, this is red, and this is green, and that's because generally, uh, depending on, on what you're trying to do, but um, this is actually supposed to say bounce rate, um, but it's here, but not on the, the axis itself. Um, but this is the bounce rate number. And generally uh, for a website, a lower bounce rate um, is considered better. And so you would say the three lowest bounce rates are green, the ones in the middle are medium, and the worst ones, these two are red. And so this is a, a poor way of doing it because again, you're displaying um, displaying meaning with just color. Um, and that's just that's just not a, a, an appropriate way or, or a conformant way of doing it. Um, and uh, additionally, well, there's only one line graph, but um, you know, you might want to have vertices there, especially if you're going to add a second one. But since there's only one line graph, um, should be good. But um, and an, another reason, um, this is also uh, interesting because it's this is a combo graph. Um, which is a, a, good, a good way to um, separate information um, because you wouldn't want these two things. This one being a percentage only ranges between zero, one and one in Excel speak. 
um, and this range is up to you know twenty five thousand. So that's you know you couldn't necessarily even put these on the same graph because if you were and when you originally create the chart, it it auto it defaults to this and you have to change the settings. Um, but you basically the bounce rate is just a, a line across zero because it's less than one and every and this chart starts from twenty five thousand to about three thousand. Um, so anyway, overall, in terms of the non-conformant, um, showing meeting just by color, and then this is also um, not conformant for a color contrast perspective, um, and we can get into that a little bit later as well. A way to correct it, um, one, uh, as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in, um, on the slide, this is an alternative means. You provide the information right with the graph. Um, so that's you know, that's a good way of doing it. If, if this is difficult to read, um, you know, if it gets blurry based on people, you know, copying it, you know, printing it in a PDF and then scanning it in or whatever, things tend to get blurry. Um, providing information here is a good way to ensure that uh, the meeting continues or is, um, is still um, conveyed, even though this, this might get a little um, messed up from, from the, the usage. Um, the green, yellow, red, here is just indicated with a medium high and low. Um, so that provides just a little bit more different information. Um, you can, it's not even fully necessary simply because people can see that these are the lowest points and therefore, you know, it, that would be assumed to be a, um, a, a low bounce rate or a good bounce rate as opposed to the higher bounce rates across here. But um, if you wanted to include that information, instead of just doing a green, yellow, red, as we showed in the other table, um, having some sort of column here would make sense. Um, and then just in terms of alignment, or just in terms of general practice, making sure that the tags are all fully visible. On the other one, they're not. Um, they're cut off, which you know just makes it hard to view. Um, and there's labels for the axes as well. Um, when we get to when we get to the PowerPoint, we'll talk about um, the information that's behind the graph. So when you copy and paste a graph, um, a graphic into um, a PowerPoint, you'll actually this the information that is behind the chart, which in this case is, is just right next to it here, uh, will go with it, and we'll we'll go into that um, when we go to the PowerPoint in the next demonstration. Um, gentlemen, anything else uh, on this that I missed for? Um, specifically about graphics in Excel um, that we, we need to cover. Uh, you, you know, sorry. I, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, I was actually gonna say, I don't, I don't have anything else to add, but uh, Drew, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that, um, uh, you, you know, maybe if we could pause for a second, there were a couple of questions that might, uh, you know, could. Could be helpful to go back to uh, related to tables, but let's let's finish this thought and then um, and then we can go back uh, and before we move on. Okay, um, so I think we're good with this. You want to go back to the the tables corrections specifically? Yeah, yeah. So we've had a, a few good questions come in through chat. Um, Mike has has responded in chat, but it, it looks like we. I, I think it could be beneficial to have a little bit of discussion and to clarify for everyone. Uh, so one of the one of the one of the top topics of, topics of conversation in the chat is is whether or not we should repeat uh, headings across when when a table breaks across pages, and and it is possible uh, in let's say if you're in Microsoft Word, um, it's possible for a screen reader user to still get those those uh, table heading associations even when it's moving across pages. Mike makes a, a, a I think uh, gives us a good point that. Sometimes when you convert to PDF, then then those table header associations are broken, um, and 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 so and and on top of that, uh, and which is probably something you need to address uh, directly in the PDF document, anyways. But on top of that, uh, for people with cognitive disabilities, and, and even just for reading comprehension in general, um, with or without any cognitive dis disability, uh, we would offer that as best practice to include those headers even when it breaks pages. Uh, just just for reading comprehension, so it's easier to go back and, and see where you're starting from. Um, Mike, was there another question there we, we wanted to address on on that? No, another, we had another one. Not on. Uh, I don't believe we have another one on on the table headers. Um, I think they all centered around around the headings and the and the and the rows. 
And, and so another question related uh, from, from Julia is, uh, I think the comment was that she does that manually and to clarify um, the, so, so there is a way to do that in, in Microsoft Word um, to have the have table headers uh, repeat over the page. And the way that you, you do that, um, I'm, without demoing it on the screen, uh, the way that you do that is you highlight the header row and, and then you go to the table settings and and go to row, and then you can repeat row as header, um, or or you can repeat multiple rows. But but our suggestion would be to just to repeat the the header row. Um, and we can talk more about that, and, and certainly can uh, answer questions offline as well. Um, but uh, Alex, please uh, continue. Okay, excellent. Thanks for that, gentlemen. Um, so well, yeah, we'll we'll save a lot of those questions for the end. I think, um, especially because we won't get uh, too much into. Um, the documents and, and PDF. So please send in um, any questions you have specifically for, for documents and the, the breaking of a header row would be for, for uh, a, like a word, a word document uh, or any sort of um, uh, word software uh, specifically. Um, but if there's any questions on, on that sort of thing and creating a document or creating a PDF, uh, make sure to put those in uh, the chat as well so that we can cover them at the end because we will not um, spend too much time on that during the, the session, if at all, depending on our, our timeline. Okay, so right now we're gonna go back to our document and we will go into um, our, our presentation uh, accessibility. So this one is just a little bit more involved um, simply because there's a lot of different things you can do with uh, presentations and you know specifically we were talking about um, Microsoft PowerPoint today, but there's there's other formats just as G slides and in, in, um, some other formatting um, or other software that is. But we'll focus just you know for as an example, we'll focus on PowerPoint, which is why we're presenting in PowerPoint, and, and the the demo for the uh, PowerPoint example. Um, but just starting at the top, similar to spreadsheet, and I, I said this before, making sure you have a descriptive file name and then unambiguous links. Um, and this is specifically true for, for PowerPoint decks, um, just because it's relatively hard to kind of chase that down if you don't have that information um, specifically uh, named out or uh, unambiguous uh, on the slide. Um, and then we'll jump right into images. A lot of what you use um, presentations for specifically are for images. So having, you know, you might have uh, some lists as well, some bulleted lists, um, as you can see on this slide. Uh, but oftentimes you want to show and present graphics um, or, you know, you'll have a picture on a, uh, on a slide. And so you want to make sure that a picture similar to um, the one on here uh, on this slide to the right um, has alt text. So, you know, for instance, and we'll get into the example, but alt text for the right would be uh, something like two business people uh, shaking hands with a business, um, uh, a, a, a business scene or uh, in, in the background. Um, this is slightly blurry, at least it looks to me, simply because of um, it's being stretched out for the presentation. But if you were to view this on your regular screen, it's it's not blurry on my screen. Um, you also don't want to use uh, flashing images, um, or um, you also don't want to use kind of like slide transitions, and we'll get to that. Uh, I believe that's on the, the next slide as well. Um, but what you want to do is make sure that, um, yeah, the images aren't flashing for um, for those with, with potential issues um, to, to flashing. And that, that's also true for, um, for websites and, and anything else. But, um, but you wanna use uh, just flat, flat images uh, like you have on the right here um, that aren't blurry, that have, um, that have high contrast. Um, and if you're using a picture, say an icon, uh, you wanna make sure that there's specific color contrast. Um, and if we have time at the end, we can pull up uh, one of the examples of uh, color contrast and um, talk about that as well. So uh, we'll go right into the next demo, which is around slide formatting specifically. All right. Alex, this is Mike. If I could uh, jump in real quick, there was a question on whether GIFs count as flashing or if a GIF is okay, as long as it doesn't have flashing elements. So. I'll use the word animation. So if the GIF has some animation, that is fine, but you don't want it to blink or flash um, because there are folks that can have seizures that are, uh, you know, they're photosensitive and they're 
Um, so, so an animation is fine, um, but, but it's really that flashing, that quick flashing that we don't wanna have a strobing kind of effect uh, that, that can impact some people. Hopefully that helps. Okay, excellent. All right, so our first, uh, for our first demo here, actually in order to, um, I'll just make it bigger just so you can see it at first, but in order to actually make changes, I'll have to use um, the normal layout. Uh, but this is just a journal slide. Uh, if you can see here, there's an icon with people sitting at a table uh, with a, just a blue circle as to provide um, some contrast. Uh, this is just a, a just standard circle. We have a graph. This is the same graph we just went over um, for the, the, the good example uh, in our spreadsheet um, demo that we just did and then the image that we just had. And it's just to show uh, some of the few things that you can do and in, in, um, in see in PowerPoint. So um, one of the things that uh, we talked about is to have alternative text. Um, and again, we'll get into this when we actually do some, some remediation on the next slide, um, which is, is a copy of this, but I wanted to have uh, for the next demo, um, actually it's demo five, but for the next demo, um, we'll show the same thing and just show how it presents actual errors and go through um, the accessibility checker itself, uh, but I actually need to bring that up to do what we do here. Um, so what you want to do, um, one of the things you can do, um, this says that this has missing alternative text. And so one of the things you, you can do um, to decrease the amount of things you can check, especially if they're together, is you select and then group things. And then as you can see that decreased the number of items with errors, right? Because all of these things don't have alternative text um, on the slide. So, well, these are, I pre-populated these with alternative text, but these elements and then the same elements from the next page don't have, um, uh, do not have alternative text. So what you would do is you go here, you would, uh, right click, you edit all text, and you would drop all text info in here. Um, something like, you know, uh, icon of um, four business people uh, sitting at a table. Um, this one you could mark as decorative, and you do that by just clicking this here. Um, and then these already have alternative text in them. And this is very hard to see. Uh, there's no real other way of doing this, uh, to my knowledge. Like maybe I can make this a little bigger, but that doesn't make the text any bigger. Um, but basically, this is the alt text that's in the image. Um, I'll read it out. It says monthly page views and bounce rates of the top 10 pages viewed for section 508.gov, which is what the graph is. Um, it also says the manage laws and policies page and the create documents pages have relatively high bounce rates, which are these while the test documents and create accessible products pages have the lowest bounce rates out of the top 10 pages viewed. And that's this one and this one right here. Um, and then it also says data can be accessed by using the right click uh, or context menu and navigating to edit data. So that's what I mentioned in the spreadsheet. So if you remember, and I'll just show this really quickly, um, this had, you had a table here and you had the graphic. Now, when you actually add it to PowerPoint, um, oftentimes you're not gonna wanna add just a table to PowerPoint. What you wanna do is just add the graphic. And so you would, if you copy and paste it from an Excel, um, it'll natively bring the information over. And even though you can't see it, um, it creates a separate Excel just based on the information that is linked to the table um, in the background. So there's nothing, something you can see, but it's in the metadata of the graph that's on the page. So in order to bring that up, you would just go here, edit data, um, and you'll be able to see that the same information that was in that chart has been brought over here. And as you can see, this is, it's actually linked to the table because they both reside in my computer. Um, but this is something that we tested. If you send it to someone and you only send the um, only send the PowerPoint file, it'll still bring this information. It'll just be uh, in the background. Whereas here it says, you know, table, it says uh, demo two correct, um, which is what I call it simply because they're both on my computer at once. Um, but again, if you send this, it'll still be in the background of that table. 
Um, as you can see, the you know again similar to the other table, the color contrast is conformant, um, and uh, this is easily viewable on the screen. Uh, anything else, gentlemen? We'll get into the accessibility checker in more detail um, for the demo five. Um, but is there anything else just on, um, you know, making the graph, making the all text specifically um, for? Yeah, Alex, uh, we'll jump in uh, on a couple of questions uh, that, that we're getting. Uh, one question Mike did uh, address in in uh, the chat, uh, but 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 again, probably good to, to bring it up uh, to bring everyone's attention to it. And, and I think we did have a, a request also to answer <laughs> chat questions in the chat. We'll do our best. Uh, uh, so, sometimes uh, it, it's just a little bit easier to address in, uh, verbally, um, given all of the questions coming in. Uh, but the, the question related to, uh, the, to the icons, and uh, the question was, I read that, uh, that little icons should always have text under them, explaining what the image means to be ex to, in, in, order, in order to be accessible. Um, and, uh, and, and the answer to that, so curious to know what we think. Um, uh, no, you don't always have to have text to, to uh, underneath the image to describe what it means. Um, you, can, you can provide alt text for the image and, and that, that, sh that should, sh should be su sufficient. Um, I mean, the, you know, if there's any question of, uh, as to whether or not, um, it, you know, the image actually conveys meaning or is decorative, uh, you know, that's where Alex went through and, and uh, uh, you know, certainly, if it is meaningful, which icons usually are, they just they convey some type of information. Then, then you should provide alt text. Um, now, you could provide text below the below the image. Um, if if you do that, text may not be an uh, alt text may not be necessary for a screen reader user if the text is also on the screen. Um, and and so then that you might consider the icon to to then be decorative because there is text describing it. So you could mark the icon as as decorative, um, and rely on the text uh, underneath the or that, that accompanies the the icon to give the, the description. Um, we have another question uh, from uh, excuse me let me let me track that down again. Um, we, we have a, a comment I guess the most frequent causes of 508 errors, errors I see in accessibility tests of PowerPoints of, or PDFs are made from a missing title for slides and, and I wanted to address that one because uh, I, I, Alex, I think you may have, may have, may have already mentioned it, um, but uh, but definitely recommend using the the native styles um, in uh, within the the a PowerPoint presentation and in Word for that matter. Um, so if you're going to add a title to the slide, make sure you actually insert the that place marker for a title and 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 uh, and format as a title. And same goes in, in Microsoft Word. If you're adding headings, don't just add text and then bold it. Um, uh, you should be adding that using the native styles. That gives people using assistive technologies the programmatic cues they need in order to be able to navigate the document. Um, so, so that's a great comment um, in, in the chat. Um, let's see, I think we did have one other one. Uh, I apologize for, for having to track it down. Um, uh, Sorry, I missed it. We'll have to come back to that in the QA. Uh, thanks, Alex. Sure, and that, that makes sense. We can um, yeah, definitely want to keep at least some of the questions for the end. Um, and if we're answering a lot of the questions, um, please feel free, again, to, to continue to submit questions, uh, whether it's on uh, spreadsheets or, or PowerPoints or even Word docs or PDFs, um, again, which we won't have too much time to get to in the session um, at the end. And then, you know, hopefully we'll be able to cover, cover at least some of those um, in the last, in the final 30 minutes of the session. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I forgot to mention, um, these two slides have the same name as well um, with respect to the title. And that is on purpose to, um, to show that you, you will likely get an error for um, a repeated, um, for an interesting title or a repeated title uh, between pages. So uh, similar to what uh, Andrew was just saying about, you know, making sure you don't just kind of create a text box um, and, you just don't create a text box and say, okay, you know, increase the font and then, in, you know, bold it and then put it at the top. Um, you use the native style, which, you know, when you go into layout, you add a new page. Um, and then, you know, this is actually a title on the top. Um, then you put the information in there as opposed to adding a text box. Then again, the program knows that it's a title for the slide and not just uh, one of the standard text boxes on the page. 
Okay. So we'll go back to our, our main presentation. And next, uh, what we want to talk about, and now that we've talked about some, um, some formatting in spreadsheets, we've talked about some charts in a spreadsheet, we talked about some additional slide formatting or general slide formatting. And um, some of the things, and now we'll talk some additional um, formatting, and then as well, we'll get into some multimedia, so audio and video and combined audio and video that then Mark will go through in a second. Um, but just starting at the top, um, similar to using the, the title, the native features for title, you also want to use um, the native bulletizing features or native bullet features. So um, instead of opening a text box and typing a period or typing a dash is what generally you would see people putting a dash or, or two dashes to make a hyphen. Instead of doing that, you would, um, might be a little bit easier to, um, instead of just putting in a dash, you would then, you would actually select and just make sure it's the native features of a bullet as opposed to, you know, me just typing in a dash for, uh, for a bullet. So if you do it that way, it doesn't understand, the program's not gonna understand that this is all part of the same list. Um, if you use the bullet features, it will know that this is all part of the same list and that this information is subordinate or, or falls under um, this bullet. Um, if you were to just put a dash here and then you know add two spaces and put a dash here, um, visually you'll be able to see that, but the program itself will not understand that that is um, a list that goes together. Um, the next thing is uh, page numbers, and that's just down here. Um, oftentimes the, the slide master will have the ability to put in page numbers. Um, I don't know if we want to get too deep in going to, to the slide master, but basically, um, you know, in the background, you'll be able to change some of the features um, of a PowerPoint. And one of the things will be uh, for each of the slides. And that's how you create each of these layouts. Um, just do that without actually going into a slide master. But when you create these layouts, oftentimes there'll be ones with um, page numbers at the bottom, and you just want to make sure that that's there um, so that if people are using trainers, they'll know that that's uh, the number of the page that you're on. Um, also, just from a general format, when you're presenting or if you hand someone a, a slide deck of 25 slides, um, you want to make sure that there's slide numbers on it. So in case they um, are viewing it in different order um, and they kind of put it into different piles or in any way break up that information, you want them to be able to easily um, collate it or bring it back together again um, in a in a you know in in the way in which they were originally presented. And if you don't have uh, a slide number, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So that's not necessarily. I mean, it, it is a an accessibility tip, but that's just kind of a creating a PowerPoint type of best practice as well. Um, and then this is something I mentioned all the way at the beginning. Um, I forgot it was here at the end. Um, one of the things that you don't want to do again from a general perspective and also for conformers perspective is to add slide transitions. So that would be um, when you come up to a slide, it might be blank. And then when you, you know, click on it, the first line will come in, you click on it again, the second line will come in. Um, I personally just, I don't like those in general. Also, it's, it takes a lot of time to really do if you've ever tried to do it. Um, and it can get broken very, very easily. Um, if you were to delete a text box and then put it back in, it's going to totally mess up the order because it's, it's based on the reading order. Um, and in general, it's just not a, a best practice. It's just really difficult to, to keep up and to make sure it doesn't break. Um, but it's also not really conformant as well. So just suggest against using those sorts of slide transitions. Uh, I didn't put one in here. I just, I don't ever use them. Um, but uh, you do see sometimes uh, transitions in PowerPoints and presentations in general um, and just kind of suggest against them. Okay, uh, and now we'll, Mike will just bring us through um, in, embedded multimedia and we'll play a few videos and then Mike will explain um, what they mean and, and kind of the way in which to make um, multimedia conformant. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so some of the things that we do um, within our presentations and some of this, you know, may play over into different ways that we publish information, but we wanted to talk a little bit about captioning and, and audio descriptions. Um, and 
some of the other media that, media that we may use, podcasts or, or things of that nature. So um, in our, in, in, you know, most of us talk about um, video, uh, use the word video, but in our world, we have to say video only because we have video and audio together. So there's audio only, like a transcript. Uh, think of it as a podcast or an interview between two people. Uh, you would have a transcript text equivalent that would have a person's name, what they said, another paragraph, the other person's name, what they said. And it's pretty linear uh, in that way. You might also include um, notes of where there's sound or music or something that's meaningful uh, to the understanding of what those two, two people are saying. Um, in video only, this would be either video or an animation of some sort that doesn't have sound. And what I mean by that is not necessarily there's no sound at all. There could be kind of a cutesy background sound that isn't meaningful. But what I mean is that there's no meaningful information presented through sound, either through speech or, or some other effect. Um, and in that case, we would need a text description. We would need to describe in words what was occurring on that page uh, so that someone who couldn't see the animation, how it moved, um, what text was displayed on the screen, or any movements like we would see in a training course, you know, moving a mouse or a keyboard focus to a particular element and selecting that, things like that, we would want to describe sufficiently and accurately uh, so that someone can complete that task. And then in what we call multimedia, um, the rest of us just call video, uh, this is where we have synchronized um, audio and video together. And we wanna have captions that are also synchronized with either that spoken word uh, or sound, music, um, sound effects, things of that nature, uh, so that people can comprehend what's going on. And we have uh, two quick demos today to show um, captioning, which I think most of us, you know, might see and, and, and perhaps use. Uh, a lot of folks use it on TV these days because the whisper acting that's out there. Um, but, and then the second one that, that Alex will show, uh, and we'll just go back to back Alex, uh, would be one on audio descriptions. Um, just a quick reminder, the captioning would be for our colleagues and, and citizens that um, can see but cannot hear. And the audio descriptions would be for, for those who can hear but cannot see. Thanks, Alex. We watched the water come up the sidewalk, probably another six inches, and it would have been in here. One of my neighbors sat and watched her house across the street flood. Nature's going to do what nature wants to do, and I have no doubt that this house could flood. It's just part of living in South Louisiana. Flood insurance is buying comfort. That's how I feel about it. For more information, visit floodsmart.gov. And then the second one. Kathy stands near Pool of Rainwater in Street. We watched the water come up the sidewalk, probably another six inches, and it would have been in here. In doorway of her home. One of my neighbors sat and watched her house across the street flood. Nature's gonna do what nature wants to do, and... She picks up garden tools and basket. I have no doubt that this house could flood. She begins to prune vines near fence. It's just part of living in South Louisiana. Kathy adds seed to bird feeder. Flood insurance is buying comfort. That's how I feel about it. For more information, visit floodsmart.gov. Thanks, Alex. So again, in, in the first video, um, that had captioning, we noticed that um, the captioned text was easily readable. It was only a few words over two lines and synchronized with uh, around the time that, that those words were spoken. Uh, so that's an important piece for folks to be able to quickly read what's on the screen and, and continue to participate in, in, that, in that video. In the second one, you'll notice we didn't have captioning because we're not accommodating individuals um, who, need that, who need that service. So we're looking to describe in words what they would have missed visually. And, and you'll notice that, that while not everything that Kathy was doing was described, enough of that can, was described to convey the, the, the scene, the emotion of the scene, um, which is what folks that, were, that are visual 
uh, are able to gain from, from that as well. And so uh, just through a, a, a few short words, uh, they were able to do that. And the way this was produced, um, you could tell it was planned because one video is about 31 seconds and the second one is I think 30, uh, 41 or 42. And so they used enough of their media to build space um, so that it wasn't jagged or an afterthought, but they built enough space for that secondary audio track uh, for that information to be described. And I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, what's on screen here today, um, which is a, a planning accessible audio and video media projects flowchart. Uh, this is available on section 508.gov uh, in the create section under synchronized media content. And, and it will help folks either that are creating or that are responsible for making sure that accessible media um, are, are, or media, that media is accessible before they're published. And the first, the one example I'll go over today would be um, that we're starting with a, a, a planning a project and we ask ourselves, will we be using sound? Yes or no for this project. And for this discussion, we'll go with yes. Then the next question would be, are we using video? So is this going to be a synchronized uh, media project, meaning sound and audio in this case, uh, excuse me, sound and video in this case? And if the answer is yes, then it's synchronized media. And we need both a, the primary video to have captioning and an, uh, to ensure that audio descriptions when necessary are there. Sometimes they're not necessary. And the quick example there would be if we're, if we're recording and displaying a video uh, of the administrator speaking, um, as long as that the administrator states all of the things that would be displayed as text on screen or describes any media that he or she are referencing, um, that can be included in just one video. But if we need something like the Kathy story where visual information is not being described by the natural narration, that second media file would need to be there. Backing up a little bit, if the question to, does my sound media include video? If the answer is no, uh, this is just an audio only media, and then we'll just need that transcript. Again, uh, a text description that conveys the meaning uh, for understanding and comprehension um, if, that, that is associated with that file and wherever it's published. So again, you can see this flowchart and a bunch of other information, including the links to the Kathy video. So you can watch them uh, a little again over if you wanna see the nuances there. Again, that's on section 508.gov in create under accessible synchronized media content. Thanks, Alex. Hey, Mike, before we uh, move yep. on, uh, we had a question just drop into the chat uh, from Karen uh, Goe. Uh, the question is, we are trying to retrofit some YouTube video clips that are embedded in e-learning with descriptive audio file added to the e-learning screen and time sync. Are there, are there better or other or better fixes for adding uh, descriptive audio or audio description? Yeah, that's a great question, Karen, and I'm, and I'm gonna trust that my colleague Andrew will correct me if I say something wrong or I don't uh, fully completely answer. So what you're describing is, is quite the challenge, right? So you're just, you're, task is to retrofit a video that wasn't planned with audio descriptions in mind. And so unless you already have the B-roll, you know, the, the video or the other stuff that went along with it, um, it could be time consuming or expensive to, you know, go back and do that. Uh, another option uh, and is also shown on the uh, section 508.gov page I mentioned is like an old commercial that someone took and where they inserted pauses, uh, created pa unnatural pauses in the content to add that description. And that's one way of doing it as well. It's not as elegant. Uh, I know we all love our work to be, you know, as elegant as possible, but sometimes, you know, retrofitting may require, um, you know, doing something where you're just pausing the content or stretching that out a little bit. Drew, anything else to add to that? No, I, you, I think, uh, yeah, you hit it. Unless Karen has uh, any, you know, any other clarification on that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a great response. Thanks. Yeah, so she said, she, she said in text that they can't redo the YouTube videos. Um, so they're looking for another, another workaround. And 
yeah, Karen, why don't you send us an email so we can get a little bit more particulars about your project? Uh, I, you know, yeah. I, I think there might be, it sounds like there's a little more on, under under there than than just what's said. So yeah, great. Thanks. Reach out. To yeah, me. I, I would just reiterate that, 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 you know, unfortunately, you know, Karen, that, that is a hard lesson to learn. Um, and, you know, for uh, everyone else listening, I obviously plan ahead so that you can work it in and, and you know, make it make, make those smoother transitions. Um, but but yeah, uh, Karen, please uh, feel free to, to email us and, and uh, happy to happy to give any any additional insight we can. Uh, and and to that respect, um, we'll include our our emails in the chat at the end. Uh, we actually I had forgotten I neglected to put a slide with our, our contact information at the end of this document. Um, or you can also contact us at section dot five zero eight um, at at gsa.gov. Uh, but we'll we'll include information. We'll work with the digital gov team. Um, to get our information in there. We'll add it. It's not on, on this slide, um, but we'll get it in some way, whether it's on the website itself um, or if we just add a slide to the, the PDF just so that the information's there so you can contact us. Um, <clears throat> and I know that on the digital.gov site, there's, you know, they have our profiles there, um, but just to make it easier, we'll, we can uh, get that added either to the description um, or to the just the document itself uh, that's on digital.gov. Okay. So thanks, Mike, for that. Um, we're actually running pretty good on time, uh, but I just wanted to um, just keep going here. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about presentations. We'll close it out. Um, so again, um, as we're getting close to the question period uh, and we have time now to, to really get into um, documents or PDFs, so if you have any questions on those as well, um, feel free to send in so that uh, Andrew and Mike can start um, collecting those so we'll have them so we can address them at the end, uh, just around about four or five minutes um, when we get to the question period. So um, to to talk about, uh, to, to close out presentation accessibility, um, at least the, these highlights and in, in, in these uh, high level tips and tricks. Um, one of the things that I did just show and we'll go in just a little bit more detail now is the accessibility checker. Um, and that will allow you to remediate issues and errors um, in Microsoft Excel specifically. So we'll just jump right into that. Um, these are some of the things that you can, you can do, all text, uh, duplicate page titles, color contrast, reading order, et cetera. Um, you can all at least view the errors from, um, from the accessibility checker, and then you can um, go in and fix them um, using the, the native features that um, you can get or that have for checking and remediating accessibility. So we'll jump back into our presentation document here um, and you go to review. Um, one thing to note before I forget, uh, previously, and this is in Microsoft 365, has a tab right here. It's one of the very first tabs um, that you can go and check accessibility. But in previous versions of Microsoft, I believe it's under info, it would be here when you inspect document, um, check for accessibility. Um, so in previous versions, I believe this is the, the primary way, if not the only way to get to the accessibility checker. Um, it wasn't part of the what's called the taskbar, um, which is up here, but now it is part of the taskbar and it's under the review um, primary tab. So <clears throat> you go into check accessibility. Um, if you remember, uh, we had grouped these, so there's only one thing to remediate. Um, we can add and all text um, and what have you, this one um, doesn't have all text you remember. And because these are um, repeated slides, it's the same. Um, and these do have all text. So you can go in, um, you can edit all text from here or you can go under here and check accessibility and pull up all text. Um, so it's a Okay, so that would be the alt text. Um, we'll just copy and paste so that. For the next slide as well, so we don't have to redo it. And because it's grouped, um, the one back here doesn't have that information. We can mark that as decorative. Uh, best practice is just to group them together as we did on this slide. Uh, but you can also do what I just did, which was to add alt text to 
the white image here, um, the, the actual uh, stick figure icons, and then um, mark the background as, um, as decorative. You could do it either way, um, but I would just suggest selecting it, grouping it, um, and editing alt text for the group. Um, similar to what we just did, you would mark this one as decorative. This doesn't really do anything in terms of the slide itself here, but we just included that to, to show that you can mark this as decorative, which means that it doesn't um, have any meaning really. It's just a, a visual. Um, it would be, you know, same if you had like a, a blue text box um, behind all this information to highlight it or, or something like that, you would mark that as decorative. Um, it just provides contrast for viewing, but it has no information um, other than that, it provides no purpose besides just, you know, creating contrast in the graphics. Um, as we said, the the graphic, the graph itself, uh, that is, has alt text already. This one has alt text. Um, so since we've done that, if we go in, check accessibility, um, this one now has alt text. Oh, and I had forgotten to mark that one as decorative. So again, you can go over here. Um, once you open it, there'll be an alt text pane here, which I, I really like. You don't have to keep going over to the accessibility checker, um, but the alt text pane will be here. Again, we mark this one as decorative. Uh, we go back to the accessibility checker, and now there's no um, there's no errors in terms of alt text because we've just um, adjudicated them all. Um, go right in here first. This is a duplicate slide title. That's because both of these have the same name. Um, so what we would want to do is just change this to side five, um, and then that should go away. Excellent. So as you can see, that's no longer over here. Um, and then the last thing is the check reading order. So this is something that almost always comes up when you check for accessibility. Um, just because when you're creating slides, it's almost never the case unless there's only one text box on the slide that you have, um, you know, put these all in exactly the same order from left to right, top to bottom, which is how the slide, which is how a screen reader will read a slide from left to right and top to bottom. And so if you, in any way, you know, you would have to put it in, you know, these are the native ones, so these would already be on there, but you would have to then put this one in, then this, then this, then this, then this, for it to be correct in the reading order. Um, because we don't really just create slides like that, the reading order will generally always be um, not perfect or not exact in the way in which it should be read uh, by a screen reader, which is again, you know, left to right and top to bottom. So you'll have to check the 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 reading order. Um, so go over here to verify object reading order. This one, okay, it's top to bottom. So that one's good. Um, you go back to the accessibility pane. Check reading order. Okay, that's good. That's good. This is now wrong, right? Um, so you'd want this to be the last thing viewed. So you'd move that to the bottom. Oh, sorry. The last thing is actually the um, the slide number, but it should be the last of the, the actual content on the page. Um, so you go back. That's correct. The group, the picture, that's off as well. And so you change the reading order. And so now if you actually go in reading order, it should be top to bottom, left to right, and you're good to go. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the next slide. It would be the same thing um, for the next slide. Uh, but as you see, slide two goes away. Um, sometimes slide one, even though if you do it, a title slide doesn't resolve uh, the accessibility uh, for some reason. It's generally, I've only found that with the title, a title page, um, but all the other slides would. And um, that's, that's what you would do the same thing for this. You check the reading order, you change it around. Um, this has the same element, so it'd be the same exact thing I just did. And now you, this wouldn't even be a warning. It's not an error. Um, it doesn't come up as an error. It comes as a warning, just, hey, check the reading order before you submit these slides or whatever you're gonna do, present them. Um, and so again, you would, if I close all this out, again, you would go to the review tab, check accessibility, that would open up the primary, or you can check some of the, the, the sub uh, tabs, which would be all text or the reading order pane. Um, anything else on that? I know we're, that took a little bit um, 
a little bit of time and want to get to the questions. Um, anything while we have this up, uh, Mike and Drew, that we, we want to touch on that I might have missed? Yeah, Alex, probably a couple things uh, that have been coming up in, in the chat. Um, one is is related is regarding the different versions of Microsoft Office, and and we've been talking about the accessibility checker here, and, and that that feature unfortunately is not available in earlier versions of Microsoft Office. I, I believe it it, it showed up um, first in in, in uh, Office three sixty five. Uh, and I believe it's in 2019, but you can, you all can correct me if, if uh, some of you know better. Um, but it, but uh, if you're using Office 365, the accessibility checker is there. If you're not, um, it if, if you're, excuse me, if you're using 2016 and earlier, it, it's the accessibility checker is not available, unfortunately. Um, there's also some difference in the reading order that uh, uh, the way that you would address reading order um, in, uh, in, in earlier versions of, of Microsoft Office uh, in, or Microsoft PowerPoint uh, specifically. Um, so with Office 365 and the check accessibility feature, they also added the reading order pane um, that before uh, we using 2016, before, before that you can still uh, address reading order, but unfortunately it's confusing. It's, it's really quite backward. Instead of using the reader or reading order pane because it doesn't exist in 2016, Instead, you would need to use the selection pane. And, and so uh, for that, uh, maybe just while you're on screen, uh, Alex, if you go to the, you can, you can still also access the, the selection pane in, in uh, Office 365 as well. But if you're using 2016 to address reading order, uh, instead of using the reading order pane, which goes in reading order from top to bottom, you would use the selection pane. And, and Alex, if you click on, on the home tab in the ribbon, and you can find it in a couple places um, uh, it, it, under here, under, under drawing, uh, in the drawing section under arrange and the drop down. Uh, at the very bottom of that drop down is the selection pane. And here's where it gets confusing. Using the selection pane, um, the selection pane is determined in the order in which you add uh, the, the item to the screen. And so instead of going top to bottom, you're going bottom to top in the selection pane, unfortunately. Uh, and so it's, confu it's confusing, it's frustrating. Um, but uh, if you're using 2016 and before, use, use the, select, or the selection pane and go bottom to top. If you're using Office 365, uh, just make it easy on yourself and use the reading order pane and, and go top to bottom. Um, other things like alt text, um, again, we, it's a little bit harder to find how to get uh, and add alt text to an image um, in earlier versions. Um, we do actually have guidance on, on how on uh, our guidance on Section 508.gov actually use, uh, it uses Office uh, 2016, and so we do have guidance there about how to how to address these issues, um, and we're working on updating for Office 365. Um, so just wanted to address a couple of those questions while we were on it, and and uh, uh, thanks for that, Alex. Okay, excellent. Um, and so do we have? Uh, so we'll go back to the deck. Uh, we'll finish very quickly, and then we'll jump into questions. Uh, at that point, we'll, we'll put on video as we discussed uh, as well. So just to close out, and, and we'll have about 20 minutes for questions, um, won't go into really any of the other information. Uh, we'll just talk about our, uh, so we have some, some tips on documents and on, um, on PDFs for documents, uh, similar to what we discussed earlier using the native features um, for documents, uh, has a very specific, the styles, um, for that has like title, heading one, heading two, as you can see here, um, those will be native in the document. Those can be changed um, in the sense of you, if you want to change what it looks like, um, you would select it, select the, the heading one, right? The heading one would be, you know, the section headers for your document, the primary divisions of the document. Um, you can select that, um, change it, and then what you would do is say update heading one, um, update the style for heading one to this text. And so you would still be able to use the native features, which is this, you know, the, the, the text for title, heading one, heading two, et cetera, um, so that the, the document or the, the, the screen readers would still be able to, to read it in correct reading order, uh, but you could, you know, customize it a little bit as well. Um, and then some very uh, similar information for, for tables um, some of the alt text uh, and, and uh, the accessibility checker as well. 
Uh, PDFs is a little bit more involved because it's not a Microsoft product, has um, some different features. Um, and we have some information on that on, on section5way.gov, uh, but, but don't have too much time to get into it now. So you can either reach out to us on that um, or you know, for a first stop, uh, view the information that we have on section5way.gov or some of the other information that's out there um, about creating accessible PDFs. Um, you know, one of the biggest features around tagging of, of all the information what's in a PDF, um, which is a little bit involved and, um, you know, please look at the information on 5 to get a little bit more information on that. Um, just some additional links, uh, some information on um, digital.gov around accessible videos. There's also a lot of information on, on social media um, on, on digital.gov as well. We have a lot of information for creating accessible spreadsheets and presentations uh, specifically, but if you go to that first link there on uh, creating digital content, um, there's links on, on digital signatures. Um, we're working on uh, a new um, a multimedia page we just posted. We're working on accessible meetings page right now that, that'll hopefully go up shortly. Uh, so there's a lot of good and, and rich information on there. Um, there's for the actual guidelines, that's the, the WCAG site there, um, the web website content accessibility guidelines. Um, and then just one example of a color contrast checker, I believe I like the one that I don't really use um, or that I use often. Um, there's, there's many, many of those out there. You just go to um, your web browser, I'm sorry, go to your, your search, um, Google or Bing or what have you, um, and search for color contrast um, checker and, and several come up. I believe the one I linked here is the web aim one. Um, and now we're, we'll go into the, the comment period. Um, so hopefully, uh, and continue to send your, your questions in. We got about uh, 15 minutes or so, um, and we'll just try to attack um, the, the questions that we haven't addressed uh, during the course of the session. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, so this is Andrew speaking again. Um, I guess uh, we, we can uh, bring our, uh, put our videos on uh, now that we don't have presentation content to, to share. Um, but uh, I, I first want to say thank you all for all of the questions uh, and really love to see the, the conversation. I, because there's so many, we're having, I, I must admit, we're having a hard time keeping up. You can probably tell uh, we're trying to address some in chat. Uh, we've been, we have, however, been keeping track uh, of the questions uh, so that we can address them now uh, address them verbally, but I, I fear we're going to run out of time. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if there's a great way for, it to, for us to suggest how, how to address all of your questions I, I, other than, you know, just email us directly. If we don't get to your question, happy to answer them. Um, and, uh, you know, where we can, we'll, we'll give you even more resources on section5way.gov. Um, you know, if we have really specific nuanced questions, happy, happy to have those discussions. Uh, but let me go back to a question that Gary Morin uh, uh, dropped in the chat very early. Uh, and, and Gary, I apologize for not, uh, not kind of catching this earlier or addressing earlier. Uh, but the, the suggestion was, or question was, can you address how, how to do this work by persons who themselves use assistive technologies such as, such as Dragon, um, not just as an end user? And, and I think that, you know, that's an excellent point. I, I think the point that I would offer to the entire group is that you're, if you're in a position where you are um, selecting what authoring tools to use um, and, and, and there's a chance that uh, that authoring tool is going to stick around, uh, you should also uh, make some effort to, uh, to certainly to make sure that that authoring tool itself is accessible and some certainly are better than others. And that should be part of all of you know, our, our procurement processes all the time. We should, we should be only buying accessible products or buying those that are the most accessible um, but the point that, that Gary brings up is, is uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the tips and tricks that we've gone through um, uh, in uh, now, not to give an endorsement to, to Microsoft in, in particular, but because we've been working in Microsoft um, today, uh, Microsoft it, over the, over the, the, the recent years, ha ha they have uh, made great uh, strides in, in making their applications more accessible. And, and, and most, if not all of the things that we showed you today um, are usable uh, you, with, by people using assistive technologies. Now, of course, there, there are some natural limitations. Um, you know, somebody using a screen reader, uh, somebody who's blind um, and, and, and um, you know, is not going to be able to use a mouse to position uh, content on a screen, for instance. Um, nevertheless, they can still use the reading order pane, um, access that if somebody using uh, dictation software like Dragon would need to use the, the navigation landmarks 
um, the the functions and features available uh, through through the the the, the dic dictation to accessibility tree um, uh, interface through the, through the accessibility API with Microsoft uh, to, uh, to to access those functions um, and and using the the reading pane for instance uh, you can still select the, those individual um, elements on the screen using the reading pane and then and then instruct uh, Microsoft PowerPoint to to move up or move down um, or or to navigate to the move up or move down button and and execute it that way if uh, for instance if you're using a screen reader so so it is possible um, I, I, I apologize we didn't address it in more detail that probably would be another another class um, uh, more specifically but the point is again um, you know if you're using authoring tools use accessible authoring tools so so that we're uh, making those tools inclusive for people with disabilities too. Um, and so that uh, that doesn't uh, discriminate against them, um, you, you know, performing in that in that type of a job function. Um, so I'm going to switch switch gears a little bit, and uh, I, I, unless I'm sorry, Alex, Mike, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was good. I'm 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 good on that question. All right, all right, all right. So let's let's go let's go back a little bit. Um, we didn't dive into PDFs uh, a whole lot. Um, we had some really questions about, uh, about using Adobe Acrobat, um, uh, Acrobat Pro, uh, using a, a piece of software called Common Look. Um, so there was some discussion about uh, making PDFs accessible. And, uh, and, and so we have a couple of those questions. Um, I think that, you know, the first question about Common Look, um, we do actually have uh, um, someone in, in the chat who, who uh, addressed me individually that I'm happy to refer questions to that is a document accessibility specialist and uses Common Look all the time. I, I, I've used it in the past. I, I'm not as familiar with recent versions, but the tool is, is a tool. It's an add-on um, tool to, to be able to use with Acrobat that, that makes, uh, gives you some shortcuts, makes it a little bit easier to, to, uh, to make, uh, to do without having to know all the entire tag structure of the document to be able to, to still make uh, document elements more accessible in, in, in Adobe. Um, uh, one person made the comment, it is possible to make content uh, completely conformant and accessible um, just in Adobe, and that's true, um, you know, maybe with some, <laughs> some, some limitations here and there, depending on the content uh, that, that we're actually uh, trying to, you know, uh, to make accessible. Um, but, uh, but, but it is true, uh, if you're familiar with Adobe, it might take some, some uh, specific training to, to learn Adobe, um, but, uh, but it's, it is possible, um, common look. And, and there are other tools, uh, but Common Look certainly uh, helps make it easier. Um, so there were also a couple questions um, uh, about converting. Um, I, I wanted to point out a comment that somebody made, uh, converting uh, documents to PDFs. Um, uh, we, obviously we see that happen a lot um, and, and we run into challenges. Uh, one, one that we mentioned is that when you can convert a table from Microsoft Word to PowerPoint, um, in Microsoft Word, if a you, an end user using a screen reader is navigating the table um, for the screen reader, uh, no difference if the, if the table uh, crosses pages um, because the screen reader user may not even notice that you're crossing a page, um, just navigating directly in the document depending on how they're navigating. Uh, but if they have the he table header, they're fine. You move into PDF and often that table header relationship gets broken. And, and so then you need, uh, you need a, um, the, the table headers on, on the next page. Uh, same, same thing goes for uh, one person made a comment about the um, icons and icon groupings in PowerPoint. And, and if you group icons in PowerPoint, will that same grouping carry forward into a PDF when you convert to PDF? Um, and, and no, uh, the, not always. <laughs> um, in, in fact, probably usually not. Uh, so a way to, to get around that is uh, um, if you know you have an icon that's grouped and you're gonna use that same icon over and over again, um, you can you can just save that as a instead of as a grouped icon, copy and then paste it in again as as an image, um, and uh, and then add the alt text to the image rather than to the grouped um, uh, the grouped el el the group of elements. Um, uh, sorry, I was also going to mention yeah, one person did point out if you are going to create a PDF from Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, use the create PDF function in the Acrobat. Um, it, it would show up as an Acrobat tab, the Acrobat add-on or plugin. Um, do not print to PDF. In most cases, now, the, depending on, on what your source material is, 
Um, some applications are, are doing better at, uh, at creating uh, uh, tags in the document to make the, the, the content accessible, but, uh, but wherever possible, use the plugin to actually create a PDF rather than print to PDF. Um, that uh, that uh, results And in Andrew, right there, you can also, yeah, you can just save as PDF, right? So um, when you go into the file function, you say save as um, PDF, and it'll, that, that'll perform the same function. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, well, I guess there were questions about versions of, of Acrobat. Um, I, I, there, there was, a, oh, I think there was one question. Um, the, back to that comment about whether or not it's possible to make content fully accessible in Acrobat. That is true. Another question was, was whether or not Acrobat's accessibility checker is capable of, of fully checking for accessibility. And and uh, the answer is same for, for both for Adobe Acrobat's accessibility checker and for the Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office accessibility checkers. You'll notice that if you run the accessibility checker, there are some tests that it tells you you need to check on your own. Um, and, and that's simply because it requires kind of some human cognition. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, Section 5 weight requirements for, for accessibility is, is that you should not use color alone to convey information. Um, that kind of requires a human brain. Uh, our, our, as, as sophisticated as our, as our um, artificial intelligences are, uh, you know, that we have some, some that are available, they're not quite that smart yet to know um, by the, uh, all of the context on the page whether or not it's, it's using only color to convey information. If we are using color to convey information, we need to provide that in some other fashion, either with patterns or with text on the page. Um, and so, so that's one thing that the accessibility checkers cannot check. Similarly, they, they can check whether or not you have provided alternative text for an image, but they can't tell you whether or not it's, it's an equivalent description. So, so those things you still need to check on your own. And, and, uh, and so while it's, you know, the functionality uh, of those applications is, 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 is able, you, you can use the functionality to make it accessible. It's not gonna do it for you all the time. Um, and it's not, it's not always gonna pick up on every error, um, but, but they have done uh, a pretty good job at, at prompting you when you need to, uh, what things you need to check on your own. All right, uh, Mike, Alex, anything to add to, to that comment? There was a, a comment in the chat I did wanna uh, bring up uh, in the discussion about common look. Uh, common look is an add-on and it, there is a cost associated to it so which is why many of us have, may not have heard of it except for perhaps those that are technical writers or, or that are doing this um, type of work uh, all the time so it is a, it is a cost and obviously for your agency you'd have to just you know find out whether it's permitted on your your network at all um, a couple other tools that were mentioned in the chat one of them uh, was the color contrast analyzer uh, which we didn't cover today, but it allows folks to look at the contrast of text on a background um, at GSA that can be requested uh, through the way that we request software that is available uh, for our use here at GSA. And there was also a question about um, screen free screen readers that are out there. Uh, the question was answered by someone in the chat, but the NVDA uh, is, a, is a no cost uh, screen reader. Uh, can be used by an individual in that way. And that is also available uh, for limited use on the GSA network. Um, just a quick note about that. The Section 508 standards are a code inspection based um, kind of, or I should say the standards are not. The way we <laughs> evaluate those standards, uh, we look at from a code inspection um, methodology. And there are some folks that are accustomed to using screen readers to test. And while that is not wrong per se, um, screen readers are inherently designed to figure out bad code and to solve that for individuals that are trying to access uh, that information. And so they may not indicate an error when there is an error in the code. And so they can be used in concert with understanding how accessible your product is, but they shouldn't be used as the primary way to evaluate conformance. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, sorry, just one other point on that, you know, con conversion to PDF uh, discussion. Um, uh, it, it, whenever possible, now, sometimes PDFs are just necessary. Um, uh, when, whenever possible, um, 
uh, it, but PDFs are just hard sometimes, and they're sometimes hard to make accessible. Uh, my preference would always be to present, if you're, if you're gonna post it on the web, make it an HTML page. Uh, that's so much easier to deal with and, and make accessible. If you know that your users all, uh, you know, they're all part of your enterprise and you all have Microsoft Word and, and they're the only ones that are gonna view it, just keep it in Microsoft Word. If you have, even if your document starts as an accessible document in Microsoft Word, as soon as you convert to PDF, almost 100% of the time, you're gonna have some issue that you have to remediate in, in the PDF. Um, whether it's simply adding a, a document title because you forgot to add it in the properties of, um, of Microsoft Word. Even if you do add it in Microsoft Word, there's still like, you have to make sure that you've got it in this one little dropdown selection um, on, on the, you know, the doc, document uh, you know, initiation. Uh, when when you when you show the document uh, information, um, and and you and you all and you know, checking for language, um, but often you know some of those things like uh, you know the table of relationships breaking, uh, reading order can sometimes get get broken, um, and and sometimes when you have you know different nesting nesting of elements uh, that can get messed up. So um, uh, so some of that can get difficult to address. So I would I would just always suggest if you can avoid <laughs> putting into a PDF. Um, uh, try to avoid it. Uh, we we uh, you know put it in the in the native source if you can. But again, sometimes we can't we can't be sure that somebody is, has Microsoft Word installed. We have to provide it in in uh, you know in uh, make it uh, available in, in in a way that's freely accessible as well, not just um, accessible to people with disabilities. But let's do both. Uh, I think well, we had another uh, question. I don't want to focus entirely on on PDFs. Um, there was a question uh, from, uh, and I, I forget who, who it came from. I, the question was related to uh, form, documents, uh, or excuse me, forms in PDFs, and whether or not uh, you know it's uh, you know noticing that when you're navigating with a screen reader, navigating using the arrow keys versus with a tab, it seems like you might be missing information. Um, that is probably a little bit longer conversation. Um, most of that actually has to do with the the screen reader user, and they they are accustomed to navigate. There are different modes of navigation uh, where you can navigate just to the text or um, or to objects, and and uh, and so some of that comes down to the a new screen reader user may get confused. Uh, a, a savvy screen reader user will know how to navigate that. Um, uh, but so it comes back to just uh, making the document accessible, and as long as you're it, it's accessible, um, uh, you know it helps to to know what a screen reader user might experience, but. Um, you know, come back to making sure that you're conformant with the standard and, and, and you're good to go. Um, but, but, but yeah, there's a larger conversation about that. Um, Mike, Alex, any, any other questions that pointed out to you while, while I search for the next one on, on, on my list? All right, I'm gonna hit a couple then. No, no, no. We've no run, I think actually we, we've run out of time. Do we need to- yep. do we Hey, Andrew, I, yeah. I just messaged you privately. Yeah, uh, I, I just down wanted down to let you know it's 3.30. So that is the end of the event actually. Yeah, but yeah, all right. Amazing job um, with the presentation, the Q&A. Um, I think we save the chat transcript and can provide that to you. So if there are any outstanding questions, you can go through that. Um, and share it with the group, or if people have extra questions, they can email you all directly. Um, but yeah, just wanted to be conscious of the time. And so if you have any closing words, that would be great. Well, I'll, I'll just to start by just saying again, thank you everyone for attending. So happy to, uh, to see uh, the, the great questions and discussion. Um, I really hope you can take this back to your colleagues and, and, uh, um, and, and encourage them to watch this video. and. What's more, re reference the materials we have on section5void.gov that, that gives even more and deeper uh, information. Um, but but yeah, thank, thank you all. Um, Alex? Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, again, for participating and, and uh, taking the time, uh, 90 minutes out of your day to, to attend today. Um, we'll again get that, our, our contact information posted um, so that you'll be able to, to send an email to either the, the 508 um, broader mailbox or uh, directly to us as well. Um, within the team. Go ahead, Mike, close out. I, um, I'll echo what Andrew and Alex said, and, and really truly, we're, we are here to support you in the work that you do. Uh, you are creating the accessible content. So truly, we do mean contact us, let us know. Um, you may also be at a different agency. You have a 508 coordinator uh, that you can reach out to as well, and hopefully they can help you within your organization uh, achieve accessible um, accessibility for, for your information. So thank you again for, for taking your time out today.